Hey, Yoda. How old are you? You're not, like, immortal or anything. You're going to die, right? I'm just asking because it says here that death is a sexually transmitted disease. Hmm. Death. It's something that's going to happen to us all. We got to deal with it. So Bruegel, this is Bruegel's way of dealing with it. But humans get old and die. What about aliens? Do aliens get old and die? Well, another way of asking that question is, is aging and death such a fundamental feature of life that we should expect aliens to get old and die? Hmm. Well, remember binary fission. Here, these bacteria were getting long and then dividing into two. There was no such thing as a, a mother an old, that's older than a daughter. It, bacterial fission does not involve a parent and a child. So remember we learned about this and we have some type of symmetric replication in which one cell turned into two, but there's no way that this is the parent and this is the daughter or this is the parent and that's the daughter. They're just equally old. They don't get old. So these cells here, these prokaryotic cells are what's called haploid. And uh, here we have eukaryotes and we are haploid and diploid. My body that you're looking at right now is a diploid body and the gonads are haploid sperm. So for example, here we have a life cycle of a fish. And here, let's suppose it has three chromosomes, one, two, three, and there's two of each of those three. That's why there's six all together. It's called 2N. And the, the part of the life cycle in which this occurs is right here when you have, where you have a body. But these fish also produce eggs and sperm, and those are N, not 2N. So here you have the N, and that means they have only one copy of each of the three chromosomes. So haploid does not mean n equals 1. Haploid means there's only one copy of each of the n chromosomes. And diploid means that there are two copies, haploid and diploid. And uh, bac in bacteria, n equals 1. And in eukaryotes, n is equal 1 or 2 or 3 and sometimes up to several hundred. Now for us eukaryotes, sex and death are linked. As you can see here, and as you can see here, sex and death are linked. So let's talk about the types of death. We can have non-programmed death due to injury. Then there's programmed cell death. The first one is called necrosis, second is called apoptosis, and then there's programmed death of a multicellular organism, the kind that we will have. Senescence, getting older. But it's a programmed type of getting older, I think. So let's talk about necrosis. Here's a nice diagram of a eukaryotic cell. There are organelles and there's a nucleus in the center with DNA. And what happens in, when there's an injury is that the thing falls apart in a very disorganized way. There's no organization to it. But let's talk about apoptosis, what happens there. Then there's some kind of cue given to the cell to say, we don't want you in here, you have to commit suicide. So the cell says, okay and there's an organized disassembly in which the pieces of the cells are then reused elsewhere in the, in the body. Now, we know a little bit about apoptosis, so look carefully at this diagram on the left. Here we have a developing mouse paw at day 12.5 of its embryo, every embryo stage. And you can see the really bright red dots are where apoptosis is going on. A day later at 13.5, you can see that the uh, apoptosis has kind of sculpted away the webbing in between the fingers. And this happens also in humans. Here's a human at day 56, and you can see it too has a webbing between, beneath, between its fingers, and it too will undergo apoptosis to get rid of that webbing. So there's also a difference in gestation periods here. Mice have a three-week gestation period, while humans have 40 weeks. That's why there's a difference between 12 and 13 days versus 56 days for the apoptosis in the webbing of human paws. There's also apoptosis in normal brain development. For, so for example, here's the first trimester, second trimester, third trimester, and in the third trimester, you have pruning of brain cells, the ones that are not well connected or not being used very much. Well, they, they get, they just get turned off and they said, you have to die, and so they die. Now, we talked about this life cycle. 
We've talked about this life cycle of a slime mold before, dictostillum discoidum. And here, we, at the end of the life cycle, part of it forms the slug, part of it forms a stalk, this is here, and part of it forms a fruiting body here. And so you can ask these cells, who wants to be a stalk? And who wants to be a spore? Now that's an easy question to answer because you, who wants to die as a somatic cell? If you're a stalk, you die as a somatic cell. And who wants to live forever as germplasm? Of course you want to learn forever, live forever as germplasm. But how does that happen? How do, how do some cells say, well, I'll, okay, I'll just be a stalk, I'll die? Um, and that's an interesting question because that's what your spotty cells are all the stalk. They're the ones that are going to die and your gametes are the ones that are potentially um, immortal. So this is August Wiseman. He looks like a wise man. And he came up with this germplasm theory a long time ago, maybe more than 100 years ago. The idea is that heritable information is transmitted only by germ cells in the gonads, the ovaries and the testes, not by the somatic cells. And so in this diagram, you have a sperm cell. It uh, fertilizes a gamete or an egg cell, and then it turns into an embryo. The embryo develops into a differentiated body, the soma, but it also produces another gamete, gets, in, gets fertilized again, and turns into another embryo, which converts, well, which evolves into a soma, differentiated body cell, but then it also makes gametes, etc. and then all of this is immortal, and all of these die, die, die. So here's a diagram of that death in zygotes. So we have time going up. We have a, on A1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. That's a succession of adults going through time. Like your mother, your, your, your great-grandparents, and your grandparents, and then your parents, and then you, and then your children, and then your great-grandchildren, etc. And uh, so on the Zs, they have a succession of zygotes, Z1, Z2, Z3. So ontogeny is when you go along from the zygote into an adult. So for example, you start out as a zygote. We all start out as zygotes. And then we evolve and get older. And then we are able to make some gametes, which maybe will get fertilized. And so then our germline goes into Z6. And the rest of us are a soma. It turns into adult number five. And then it dies. So on the left, we have a, this succession of adults. You can understand it as phylogeny, the evolution. Um, but the germline is immortal. It just goes zigzags up and keeps on going and doesn't change very much. And so if you have a choice between becoming a somatic cell or a germline cell, you should become a germline cell. Now, there's a wonderful book called Sex and the Origins of Death in which the linkage between sex and death are, are discussed. And one way to understand it is for, about four billion years ago, we had the origin of life. And then about two billion years ago, we had the origin of meiotic sex and death of somatic cells. We had the origin of somatic cells. So for the first two billion years, all cells are germ cells. There are no somatic cells. To, and when, that is, when that's the case, you can have reproduction without sex or death. And when you have sex, gene exchange, you don't have to die. But then along came this great invention of meiotic sex in which, hey, I know, that's a good idea. Let's have germ cells. And then we can have sex and somatic cell death. And the soma, the body, can protect and pass on the germ cells. And if you're interested in this, the origin of this, you have no further to look than a paramecium. Now, paramecium are kind of nice because they have what's called a micronucleus and a macronucleus. And a micronucleus is a lot like the germline. It's immortal. It gets passed on to the next generation. A macronucleus does not. It becomes the soma, and it is essentially, it dies. So that's kind of, a paramecium is kind of like the origin of sex and death. So there are three types of death here. And let's talk about this last type, senescence. Now, I went to a conference of biologists, and I was very interested in this, uh, this, this, this idea of senescence. And I said, ask them, is individual death or senescence a programmed adaptive feature? This is a very controversial idea. Most of them says, well, most of them said uh, no. 
I thought, yes, the body is programmed to commit suicide. Obviously, when you get older, that's a programmed, organized thing. But most biologists say, no, the body just wears out. It can't repair itself anymore. It tries its best, but it can't do it. But I think that's wrong. New Scientist thinks that's right. New Scientist wrote just this year, from a biological point of view, aging is essentially the progressive loss of the body's ability to repair itself, which is an unfortunate product of evolution. As if, <laughs> and, and, but caloric restriction, CR, provides an organism with fewer resources to repair itself, and yet organisms which are calorically restricted live longer. You have fewer resources and you live longer, so that first statement must be wrong. So here are two plots to show you that the caloric restricted organisms live longer, survive longer than the ones that are well fed. So the idea of the body losing its ability to repair itself is just a crazy idea. Uh, I think that's just no good. And if you're interested in this idea, you can read, you can do no better than to read Cracking the Aging Code. It's a relatively new book by these uh, Josh and Dorian Sagan, Josh Middeldorf. And uh, in it, you will see the main message is that individual death is a result of group selection. That's a dirty word for some biologists, not individual selection. So the individual doesn't have a, an advantage by dying, but the group probably does. They also write that aging is a sexually transmitted disease. So here's a kindergarten teacher talking to the young students about their futures, and now I'd like each of you to tell me what you would have liked to be when you grew up had your predecessors not doomed you to be somatic cells. And remember, somatic cells are all the cells of your body that are not, gom not gametes that are going to be passed on. So we ask the question, do aliens have sex and die? Well, when you look in the media, Almost all media aliens are young and multicellular. And see how they have multicellular bodies and they're all kind of young? And the conclusion I think we should come to is that if aliens are multicellular and have sex, then yes, they will age and they will die. Just a prediction. We're not quite sure. So Yoda. On Earth, meiotic sex and death evolved about two billion years ago. So do you know uh, on your planet did sex and multicellularity and death evolve? If they didn't, maybe you're not going to die. Maybe you're immortal. So you, won't, you don't need to keep reading about this sex stuff.